Hi there, I'm Cody Hendrickson and welcome back. Um, today we're gonna be taking a look at how we can make grading for us human teachers a lot easier, as well as we can actually make sure that students are doing their code properly as we do that. So we're gonna look at how we can do this by using reflection in JUnit so we can actually work on making sure the code itself works properly as well as has the correct structures behind it. And so that's what today's um, demonstration is about is how we can do testing structures with student code. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, the first thing, just a quick introduction uh, for JUnit. Unit testing is a tool we use to design and make sure code does what it says it's going to do. And each class, and normally in JUnit, each class gets its own associated test class that goes along with it. And every method inside that class should also have an associated test. Now, I'm really anti hashtag basic stuff, so I'm not gonna test the getters and setters because, well, if the student's not getting those right, we've got other issues to worry about. And instead, I'm gonna work about this actual structure of what we're working with and the more logic and structures behind that. If you want to write tests for getters and setters, go ahead, but too much for me. Um, you can easily test all of your public methods because you simply just do the um, instance dot method call. Easy, great, wonderful. And for testing private methods, you can also test those by going and making sure that when you execute them internally via the calls of the public methods that use them, you can check the internal state, making sure those are happening as well. And I've got a video that talks about that too. What we can also do is you can um, even test the console output and discrete chunks. Now I'm going to introduce that in one of my next videos later this week. So you can work on that as well and use that as a resource. But Jane as well, just you basically do any test you want to do. You can validate the code does exactly what you want to do and check it by method by method chunks working with that. And that's what we're doing for the quick introduction. Reflection is the Java library. We can allow the code programmatically to look at itself. We can see inside the classes, and this is where I can actually look at the structural part of the code, and this is how I can make sure that students are writing code that matches the specs that we give them, and that the code itself is doing what we're supposed to be doing. So we have the unit test that tests the idea of what the functionality of the code, and the reflection test can actually look at the structure and the book, um, how the variables, method calls, etc., are all structured inside the actual what's going on inside that file we're working with. And so you can make see what's making up that class itself and operate um, on it and validate what you're actually working and sending with the students, making sure those are properly done and working with that. And so the only thing we can't see though are imports. I know it'd be wonderful if we could, but if they don't have the imports, we've got other issues we have to worry about anyway. So again, we, we can test everything we can. We, we wanna make the best possible situation out of this. So what we are gonna do is we're gonna combine these together so we can make the best of both possible worlds. So by combining both JUnit tests and regular reflection tests, we can write tests that can make sure the functionality of the student's code is available as well as we can actually write uh, tests that verify that the structure of the student's code is correct. So we can integrate those two together in a single structure or a single uh, tool and make sure we can like, oh, here's making sure the students are checking off the things they're working with and making sure they have that structure all the way through. I recommend starting this really early. I would even do this in the first assignment. That's what I'm actually planning on doing again this year, is where the um, testing code happens at the very beginning. So students incorporate the tests every single time. They can make sure they can check off each of those pieces they're working with when they're talking about writing code that goes along with it. And so they can check to make sure that all the pieces are there as they go through every step of making a process, whether it's a, a small project or a much bigger project, it's having the code to go along with it. As the projects get bigger, you can add more tests to test more things as we go along with that. But you can always start with just these basic tests, making sure, oh, I've got this thing I've accomplished, I've got this thing accomplished, and students can use that to make sure they've what they've worked on. It's a great way to make, for example, for an exit ticket, or you can even use this for the idea of uh, tying in for your CT coordinator, if you're working in the CT department, how you can work with industry trust or industry relevance, because this is something the industry does on a regular basis, is use the idea of unit testing to make sure their code is properly functional. So it's a great way we can do this. On top of that, because the students are doing something, they can actually see that they're making progress Progress towards that, it increases the student's ownership of the situation. So it's a great thing we can do just to help students out in general. Now, just a quick note, um, I'll be using JUnit 5 for all the version demonstrations I'm working with on this. If you're working with Replit, obviously you'll have to use JUnit version 4. The only big difference if you're using JUnit 4 is the parameter structure is a little bit different. The test is second and the message is first, but in JUnit 5, it's the test first and the message after. But that's the only big change you'd have to make when you're working with the idea of how you can actually handle using JUnit in those tests. So just FYI, that's a small change you might have to look at. First thing you wanna do is we wanna look at the basic testing setup. Now, I'm really big on using packages for all of my projects. I always use a package naming convention so I can actually separate what's going on inside the project itself for small projects all the way up through the bigger projects. And so the students are always using that structure for that. And as such, I put all my tests in their own package for it, whatever the tests that we're working for. So if it was the demo project where we're using the samples for, it's demo.tests is where we'll see those tests reside. And so that's how I um, organize my structure for that. You would see that on the actual files you're seeing that go along with this demonstration, as well as this uh, link that's on here for getting the actual sample code. First thing we're gonna do is talk about the imports. So the first thing, of course, we have to do is we have to do the project level imports because again, this is residing in a different package. I have to import that uh, package that we're testing and attach that right there. So that's that project level imports, in this case, demo.controller.appcontroller. 
And then we have the external needs for any components, like for example, a scanner and then or swing library for GUI components. Then we have the reflection import, which specifically we're always gonna be working with the constructor, the field, and the methods. Those are the ones we're gonna use the most often. We might also use the modifier structure, um, which we'll use to see what's inside that, but that's something we can actually look at and test. And so I just use reflect.asterisk to grab all of that. And then we have Virginia library imports. And the first one is the uh, static import for the assertions, so we can make the assertions easier to write. And then just the imports we use for the um, annotations, the prefixes that go in front of each of the methods we use as we go through that. And that's just a quick little blurb for that. Let's get a, a quick example of a really basic test. So this is the runner test, testing obviously the runner, trying to make things as easy and as simple to look at as we do that. The first thing we have to do is we have a data member of the class that we're working with. In this case, it's a private runner called tested runner. Again, we try and use good naming conventions on everything we do with the students as well. So the students can see that we are also modeling that proper behavior when we're writing our code. We make the instance of that class on there. In the app before each method of setup, we have the um, test runner is initialized to be a new runner. And in the after each, the teardown method, we have the test runner set to null. And so those are the required methods you need to have. The setup runs before every single test and the teardown runs after a test. So we have a clean copy every time we do this. Now, one thing you want to remember as you're running through these tests is that testing itself will stop at the first failure. So as soon as you fail something inside your test file, that's where it stops and that's where students can look at how to iterate over that process and rebuild their code or fix their code in an iterative process. We'll see that also in the demo video I release next week as well. So here we have our test structure on main. And so we wanna make sure that the main method is correct. So we have to make sure the modifiers are on there. It's gotta be public, it's gotta be static. It needs to return a void. It should be named main. And it should have parameters to string array. And so you also, in our runner class, it should only have that one method because the runner should only do the one thing, is run the code and make it as easy and as simple as possible. So I'm gonna check to make sure my runner class matches those requirements on a structural level. And again, you wanna remember that this test and fix process should be an iterative process. The students can go through and fix each piece. They can rerun the test over and over again, making that incremental process and learning more as they go along. So we have our test main right here. Uh, as again, it's the at test um, annotation that says that, hey, this is a test that has to run. All the tests have to be void. That's just a structure within JUnit. And so it's a public void test. And then we have a method array, and that returns all of the methods that exist inside the class, because I do tested uh, runner dot get class dot get declared methods. And the get declared methods call returns all the methods that are specified in this file. So if there's any inherited methods, they're not included. We just want the ones that are declared in the file itself. Makes it a lot nicer. And so I want to assert true that the runner methods dot length is one. I only want one method inside my runner class. And that's all it should be. And then I run, or <clears throat> and then I do int return type as runner method sub zero dot get modifier. So I'm gonna get the modifiers that exist on that method. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask modifier, hey, is this a public method? And it should be true. And hey, modifier, is this a static method? Why, yes, the main method should be static. So public static, great. The next thing, I wanna make sure that public static method is a void method. So dot get return type dot equals a void dot type. And so I'm gonna actually go in and look and make sure the types themselves match. And then I want to make sure that the name is main, of course, and there's only one parameter, and that parameter is a Java string array. And so the way we do that is we use the types sub zero dot get type name dot equals and then Java dot lang dot string square brackets, which is how Java sees internally what a string array would be. And that way, even if you're not explaining how a string array works or even what an array is, they know that they have to have that series of symbols, string, open brackets, close square bracket, inside their parameter when they're working for their main method. So you don't have to even explain that information. You can simply use that as a black box, say this is what you have to type for your main just to make it work. And now you can actually have the students build their main method explicitly, making sure that's right there. You can even have a test to make sure that main's not inside that. For example, they don't want to throw mains in every single method they're working or every single class they're working on. I know, crazy. Then we wanna look at the actual structure of the testing. This is how we can use the idea of reflection, make sure that any required methods that we need to have or any uh, things we're using to build our project are already there. And so this is again, how we can use the reflection look inside the project, making sure any, any components that we as a, a teacher or a professor specify for the project. And so we wanna make sure that they build their framework properly, making sure that all the visibilities are set properly, that the, uh, <clears throat> that the correct method names are used. And we can verify all that because of reflection. And so if you wanna make sure the uh, required methods are, all I have to do is make a, a counter variable iterate over all the methods that are inside the structure and increment each time we have a match. Boom, great stuff. Data members, same thing, make a counter variable, iterate over all the data members, and again, go up there, you can even do more verification as you go along. I'm using one of my sample classes right here for a JPanel subclass to give a demo of that because it has a lot more information we can express with that very easily, but it will work for any uh, basic type. 
So we do a method array again of tested panel.getclass.declared method. So I only want to get the methods that are in the subclass I've made of jpanel. So all the jpanel stuff, I don't worry about that. I just want the stuff that's in my class right here. So that's why I use the declared methods. I want to make sure that that methods is greater than or equal to three. They should have more than three methods at least when we're working on that. And especially we need to have setup panel, setup listeners, and setup layout. That error message, or excuse me, the message that follows after the assertion test is how the students can know what they need to do to fix that. Oh, I need to have these methods in there. And then I can make sure on the required methods that they're zero, the required visibility is zero, so I declare a couple of counter variables. And then for every method inside that, I grab the modifiers for each of the method. I check to make sure the method name is correct, and then I um, increment the method variable. And then I mo check that modifier, is this current one correct? And then I have a uh, if test for setup listeners, as well as for setup panel, basing those values that go up and down as appropriately. And then I have my assertions at the end, making sure the required methods is equal to three, that they're all present, and that they're all private, because again, I want these visibilities to be set specifically for private, so we're talking about the idea of design for that, and making sure students properly build their structures appropriately. Let's take a look at that We're using some data members as well. As you can see right here, I have my at test again, my public void test data members, and my field array, data members.testedpanel.getclass.getdeclared fields, because again, I only want to get the fields for the class I'm working with. I'm saying, hey, I want to make sure there's at least four of them. Okay, so my data members.length is greater than or equal to four. I have a button count set to zero, a visibility is set to times negative one. So I'm just do a little bit reverse check on that. And then for every field that's inside that data members array, I'm going to grab the modifiers, I want to check to see if the type is a J button class, because if there are buttons, I want to make sure I increment that count. There should be at least one button inside my J panel class. Cool. I want to make sure the modifier is private past that modifier. The um, visibility goes up by one. Then insert true twisted panel dot get layout is an instance of spring layout. I want to make sure that the panel I'm working with, they're using the right kind of layout manager for that. Cool. My button count is greater than zero. I have to have at least one button. And my visibility should now be zero because I've gone down backwards through that with that negative one and up, 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 wink. Once I get to the end, I should be properly having the correct amount of um, all the data members should be private because again, that's the way we want to have that structure going through because I've just uh, gone through and checked that all off. Then on the student side, all you have to do is make sure you bundle all your tests in a zip file and you can distribute to the students your LMS system or just as a file on the web you can share with them. Students can then import those tests to the project. It's very easy depending on whatever ID you're working with, but on Eclipse all you do is right click and choose import. Dr. Javi just drag the files in. It all works the same, pretty much the same way. Students then run their tests on the code and the students will check off the code and test, fix the code if they need to. <coughs> Excuse me. Fix that code if they need to. Upload it, re make any changes, fix it again, rerun the test as necessary. And then you can use a turn in or check off the pass those framework tests. Students get that lovely green bar of joy saying, hey, I've got this all done. I have a demo video that's going to go um, over how to uh, run through that using the sample code I provided inside this repository as well. So you can see how that process works if you haven't done it before. And you use that as a demo or example with students to show them, hey, here's how you can test your code and make sure it works for that. And finally, um, all the repository and everything that goes along with this is available here at the link below. So if you just go to the GitHub, look for Cody Hendrickson CTEC, and you have the JNet and Reflection sample um, repository right there where you can grab a copy of this, see the video, um, get links to the video, all the sample code, and use that to build your own examples as well. So you can do some great stuff and work with that. I hope this is helpful. Cheers and have a great day.